take your hymn books with me that and uh, turn over to hymn number 109. 109. Four seventy five. Oh, 
seated. Turn back to hymn number 431. 431. This evening, turn back to hymn number 12. Hymn number 12. If you would, let's take your Bibles. Go to Psalm 119. Psalm 119 this evening. <clears throat> Psalm 
Psalm 119. And if you found your place, let's stand together as we honor the reading of God's Word. We're going to go down to verse number 57. <clears throat> verse number 57. <clears throat> verse 57 begins, he says, Thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep <clears throat> thy words. I entreated thy favor with my whole heart. Be merciful unto me according to thy word. I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. The hands of the wicked have robbed me, but I have not forgotten thy law. At midnight I will rise to give thanks unto thee because of thy righteous judgments. I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. The earth, O Lord, is full of thy mercy. Teach me thy statutes. want to bring our <clears throat> message this evening of the Lord, my portion. The Lord, my portion. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you once again for allowing us the great privilege of being here tonight. We thank you, Lord, for this passage of Scripture, how valuable that it is in our hearts and lives. Lord, help us to be able to uh, see the truths that you have for us. And we just want to thank you for it and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. <clears throat> this is a wonderful section of this psalm that deals uh, with a cause and effect relationship, if you start looking at it as a whole. And we're going to break it down here in a minute. But just look at it for just a moment as an overview. Uh, the psalmist David here, he begins by saying, Thou art my portion, O Lord. He says, You're my portion. And after that, and because of that, he goes through. Now look at what he says in verse 58. He says, I entreated thy favor. Because thou art my portion. In verse 59, he says, I, I thought on my ways. He goes on in verse 59, he says, I turned my feet. Verse 60, he says, I made haste. I delayed not to keep thy commandments. Uh, he says in verse 61, I've not forgotten thy law. He says in verse 62, he says, I'll, I will rise at midnight. Uh, he says, I'll give thanks. He says in verse 63, he says, I'm a companion of all them that fear thee. Isn't that amazing? He says, the, the, the fact that you are my portion has just changed my entire life. He says, and uh, 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 having God as his portion changed every detail of, of his pursuit. He, it even changed his, his friends and those that he's, that he's around. And then he says in verse 64, he says, teach me thy statutes. Teach me thy statutes. <clears throat> he says, you know, because of who God is in his life, there's a hunger for more of God. Amen. There is a greater interest for the things of God. All of that flowed from the present relationship that he had with God. You ever think about how important your relationship is with God? I mean, not just knowing that you have one, but just how valuable that it is. How important that it is. Whenever we understand something about that valuable relationship, then it begins to line up everything else in our life. Sometimes our cause and effect kind of gets out of, out of whack. Uh, we, we, all of a sudden our greatest interest becomes all the things that we can do for the Lord instead of who He is and the relationship that we have. Now, if our relationship is right, then what we do is going to be right. But if our interest is all about the things that we do and our relationship with the Lord is second, then we'll never be able to do enough to be able to have that fulfillment of what a real inheritance is. Amen. Uh, it's kind of like uh, uh, people that think that they're going to uh, labor more for the Lord. It's, it's going to cause God to somehow love them more. Can I just tell you, God can't love you anymore. And God cannot love you any less. God is love. And His love is absolutely perfect. Now, if you've got a person that comes up to the church and they sleep 100 hours a week on the, the church pew just in case something pops up, and you've got another person that, uh, that shows up every third Sunday, you know, to be able to worship, guess what? God loves them both equally. Amen? How is that? Because His love is absolutely perfect. As people, we think about things of a performance basis. But that's not the way that God looks at, at us. He loves you. And His love is perfect. Now David made the distinction that God Himself was His most valuable asset. And any good thing flowed from that relationship. He also recognized <clears throat> that the Lord was a present tense portion. Amen? Uh, he wasn't talking about something that was going to come in the future. David wasn't looking at all the things that one day was going to come to pass because of a, uh, of, of a relationship. He said, thou art my portion. He says, it's already been established. Now there's some things, uh, certainly, that we have not yet received of the Lord. 
Amen? You know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You have eternal life. And now there's plenty of things that we're going to be able to see all throughout eternity. Uh, God says there's going to be certain things that he's, you'll, you'll be up there for a million years and he's going to peel back another layer for you and just be able to say, hey, guess what? You never knew this one, did you? You know, and, and just forever we're going to be able to rejoice in just how special that thing is. Uh, but the Lord himself is a present possession. He's not just something in the future. Now, if we understand that the way that David understood it, it will also affect us in like manner as it did David. So I want us to see just briefly tonight uh, what David shares about this portion. What does it mean about this portion? First of all, <clears throat> it was a treasured inheritance. It was a treasured inheritance. Verse 57 he says, Thou art my portion, O Lord. Thou art my portion, O Lord. Now what does that actually mean? Uh, that word portion, what it means is an allotment or it means an inheritance. He says, that's who you are. Now there's a couple of things uh, that I inherited from my granddaddy whenever he passed away that I wouldn't take anything for. Just very valuable to me. Uh, one of them, he gave me a shotgun. Uh, it was Winchester uh, Model 12. Uh, this is the pre-1964 for all of you gun, uh, gun nuts. In 1964, the Winchester Model 12 kind of went through some changes and, you know, the quality sunk. And they were trying to make competition, you know, they were trying to make things cheaper. So what they did is they took what, what used to be a steel uh, forged parts and then they started taking this little sheet metal and cast uh, you know, where, where it was just like stamped out. And so the, the internal fire mechanisms and everything, they just made them real cheap. This is before that. Uh, this was late 50s up to 63, whenever this was the gun. Uh, it's a 12 gauge, it's a pump shotgun. It's, it's, it's called a, a ramfire. I know some of you don't even care about this, but I do. <clears throat> so there you go. Uh, but it's, a, it's called a ramfire, and, and it was already pretty fast. But what happens is, is whenever you pull the trigger and you shoot, the firing pin stays out. So whenever you pump it and you shoot, kapow, kapow, you could actually shoot it faster than a semi-automatic. I mean, it was the premier deal. Now, here's the thing. My granddaddy gave me his Winchester Model 12. But the thing is, is it doesn't mean the first thing to me as far as how it shoots. I don't go out and say it patterns better than my other gun. It, it doesn't matter. What I remember is the time that I went hunting with him. I remember whenever we went goose hunting. Guess what? He took that shotgun. Amen. Everybody's got all the fancy duck guns and everything. He's out there with that Winchester Model 12, knocking down just as many. It, it reminds me whenever we went quail hunting down to South Texas. And he, he, got, he had already gotten to the point. He was older. We'd, we'd ride around on the truck. Pretty cool deal. And uh, you hop down out of the truck whenever the dogs go on point. Bang, bang, bang. Shoot everything up. You walk a little bit. Get tired. Get back on the truck, man. We drive over everything that's out there. Pretty fun. <clears throat> and I remember him already kind of getting a little bit weaker and and he still shot me, outshot me two to one at least. I mean, man, he was just blowing stuff out of the sky. And then he would talk about, well, I can't walk as good as I used to. I was like, why don't you rub it in? You know, but it was, it was part, of the, part of my inheritance. And that, that I, whenever I see it, I think of him. The other thing that it gave me was this ring. And uh, this ring is probably the most valuable thing I could think of that I own. Not because of the ring. As a kid, I would sit with him. They had a place on Toledo Bend. And, uh, and I just distinctly remember this. We would sit on the couch together. And, and as a little kid, then I would say, show me that ring. And there's something about it. You can look at it. Man, it just sparkles. There was something. I mean, I'm not a ring person. I don't care to wear a ring outside of my wedding ring. You know, I'm just not, it's just not the way I'm geared. <clears throat> and, um, but anyway, there was something. Man, I would, I would just look at that and he'd show it to me. And he'd tell me, he said, one day that's going to be yours. And I thought about that, and I was like, man, that's exciting. As a kid, I was just like, man, I've never owned a ring before in my life. I mean, that's high cotton, amen? And so, and I would think about that ring. But whenever I got that ring, I didn't think about the ring. I thought about the time that I sat with him. You know, this ring, it, it reminds me of a miracle. <clears throat> now, hey, call it what you will. But uh, if I get to heaven, God will tell me, it's like, well, here's the real explanation, but here's the deal. Uh, this was, this was to be my ring. My granddaddy always told me, he said, when I die, this is your ring. We were at the lake, and, uh, and if we would go out somewhere nice to eat, uh, it was in Manny, Louisiana, there was this seafood place uh, that was called the Lighthouse. And, uh, and anyway, it's pretty good. Frog legs were right on, <clears throat> back whenever they used to do that kind of thing. Anyway, uh, the ring was kind of uh, small for him to wear on his ring finger. So he put it on his pinky. But it's kind of heavy, so it'd roll like that. And he would always remember, he would roll it on his leg so it would ride itself. 
<clears throat> and he remembered whenever we went to that to the restaurant, he had rolled his ring and, and everything. When we got back home or to, to the lake house, that ring was gone. And he was like, oh, no. Man, it, I lost that ring. We called, that, we called the lighthouse. We said, hey, this is the place that we were sitting. This is where we were. Uh, can you look? They looked and said, no ring. Uh, they, we said, can we come up there and look ourselves? Yep, we'll stay open. They stayed open for us. We got up there. We looked all around that, all around the table and everything. Nothing. That ring was gone. Six months later, my grandmother was at not the lake house where we were, but at their house in Longview. And uh, she, had a, she would wear a pair of corduroy jean pants uh, in the wintertime. Never wear them in the summer. They're hot. And, uh, but she had them up in the top of the closet for the wintertime. Well, she pulled out that pair of jeans and she put them on and there was a lump in her pocket. Those pants had never been to that lake before ever. She had never taken them to the lake. That ring was in her pocket. I don't know. You tell me. Uh, you're like, well, I'm sure there's a good explanation. Probably so. But you know what uh, my granddad said? He said, the Lord knew that was your ring. Something special about it. It reminds me of suffering. Whenever he gave this to me, cancer had already kind of hit him pretty good. He was, it was hard for him to get around. And uh, I had been over visiting with him, and my grandma said, is there something that you wanted to go get, Jim? And he said, yeah. And he got up, and it was a lot of effort, just a couple of steps going up, and he went, left the living room, and he climbed those steps, and he went down to the bedroom, and he came back. And he gave me that ring. That was the hardest thing I ever took. Because I knew that was, that was it. That was it. But it reminds me of it. It reminds me of how much bigger he was than me. He did get it sized. It doesn't fit me at all. Not at all. And yeah, I could put it, I could have a thumb ring. I don't know what that, what that is. But anyway, but I thought about getting it sized. And then I thought, no, because it's not really my ring. It's his. And I see it and I think, man, he was so much bigger than me. It's just something special about an inheritance. It reminds me that I get to see him again. Because he received Jesus as his personal Savior, that separation is just for a time. I'm going to get to see him again, amen? Every time I see the ring, I just think, man, I'm going to see him again. I've got pictures in my office that I look at. It's just ingrained in me. I, I remember whenever we would sit together, and I, I remember the smell. I, man, he would use the Vaseline hair tonic or whatever, you know. And it, I love that smell. Some people hate that smell. Reminds me of my granddaddy. Man, I love it. I remember those times. Now, what am I saying? I'm saying whenever you've got something of an inheritance that you love so greatly, it changes what it is that's important in your life. And that's what David found out as well. David understood something about the Lord and his own work whenever, or his own walk rather, whenever he, re, he considered his portion. He said the greatest inheritance that he could ever have, he said, it's not, a, it's not a portion of land, it's not a lump of money, it's not even a kingdom. He said it's the Lord himself. David's confession was that the Lord was his portion. And, and he says that is a treasured inheritance. He says that's worth everything. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things should be added unto you. What's he, what's he telling you? He says, listen, make Christ your portion. The Lord should be your inheritance. That's your, that's your great joy. Secondly, I want you to notice there was a token utterance. There was a token utterance. Whenever he considered the treasure that he had of the Lord himself, notice what he states here in verse 57. He says, thou art my portion, O Lord. And then he says, I have said that I would keep thy words. The Lord was of such great importance that the words given by God should occupy the first place in his life. Amen? That's what it should be. It was like Samuel. Remember what it said of Samuel, that Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. And he did let none of his words fall to the ground. To keep the words of God that are given to you, that's the only way that you'll ever grow spiritually. Amen? Amen? God will give you his word 
And we got to hang on to them. You got to keep, uh, keep on. Remember whenever Paul, uh, Paul would talk to uh, believers and he'd say, what's wrong with you? He says, man, I, I came here expecting to find you on the meat spiritually. He said, you're still on the milk. Well, how do you get to the meat? You have to take the milk and hang on to it. He said, you can't keep turning it loose. You keep turning it loose. You're going to stay on milk forever. Amen. But, but the words of God, whenever you take those things in, that's that preliminary milk. And before long, you're graduating. You're moving on up to the meat. It all depends upon your value of the word of God. And David understood that the Lord himself was his portion. And because of that wonderful grace of God that had been extended to him as his portion, <clears throat> then he should have been obedient to everything that had been given to him. He should have he should have done that. But notice what he says there in verse 57. He says, thou art my portion, O Lord. Now watch this. He says, I have said that I would keep thy words. Can I tell you that's a big difference than saying, thou art my portion, O Lord. I have kept thy words. He didn't say that. He says, thou art my portion, O Lord. I have said that I would keep thy words. Two things about that. First of all, it means that uh, there was a determination that was made. There was, a, there was a thought that he had. There was a consideration of the value of the words. There was a profession that God's way was better than his own and that it deserved to be followed. There was a recognition that without faith it was impossible to please God. Amen? Without faith and without the grace of God, there would be no decision ever made really in his life. <clears throat> but also there was an intention. Just because we say something, just because we say we're going to do something doesn't mean that we're always going to follow through. Now, sometimes it's just, a, it's just a mistake, just an easy mistake. But there are certain things, if they're valuable enough to you, you will not forget it. Amen? If it's of great value to you, you're going to hang on to what it is that you said. You're going to follow that through. David confessed his intentions to God, but according to what he says here, he still hadn't followed through. He hadn't followed through. How do we know that? Now notice <clears throat> there's this thoughtful repentance. Notice what happens here. Uh, verse number 58, he says, I entreated thy favor with my whole heart. Be merciful unto me according to thy word. Now watch this, verse number 59. He says, I thought on my ways and turned my feet unto thy testimonies. I made haste and delayed not to keep thy commandments. A study of the word of God should lead you to study your own life. Amen. We never study the Word of God just so we can know some facts about the Word of God. The Word of God is, is powerful. It's, it's, it's alive. It's sharper than, than any two-edged sword. It's, it's there. It's, it's piercing to the, uh, the, the, the dividing asunder from, uh, of soul and spirit. Man, it just it, it, it magnifies your own life. Amen? It's that testimony of what it is that is valuable to you whenever you read it in the manner that it should. Uh, whenever you study the Word of God, it causes you to reflect upon yourself. David <clears throat> thought on his ways. And you know what he was saying? He was saying his ways were not lining up with what he had said he would do in the past. They weren't lining up. Notice the little preposition there in verse number uh, 59. He says, I thought on my ways, watch this, and I turned my feet unto thy testimonies. Notice he didn't say I turned my feet with the testimonies. Now, if he's walking along with the testimonies of God, if he's following God's word, well, he says, all right, God's word says go right here. Well, I'm going to stick with you. But he didn't say that. Unto means over there. It means that you're at a different location than where it is that you should be. He said unto as though there was some distance away from where he was and the right direction that God had told him to be. And where he promised he'd be. Before we're critical of David here to be able to say, I can't believe David would say that that's his portion. And all of a sudden, he's just far away from God. Yeah, we can't be critical of him at all. Amen. This should be a great time of rejoicing. Uh, most of us <clears throat> will find ourselves at times where we've got some distance between us and God. Most of us will go through that kind of a situation where we're a little further from the Lord than we should be. But it's that heart of repentance that brings us back to where it is that God wants us to be. It's whenever we start to examine the Word of God and the, the Word of God begins to examine us and we notice there's a difference between what God wants and what we've said that we would do and where we actually are. And whenever there's that distance, then we've got a decision that we have to make. That's much different than, than simply knowing that we're apart from God. Oftentimes, that 
That right there, whenever you make that, that determination, I know what God wants, but for whatever reason, I'm over here. Right there, you're at that microsecond of revival. You want to know what revival is? It's whenever you say, I'm getting back in line. That's revival. That's whenever all of a sudden God says, oh, amen. Oh, I knew you loved me. I knew you said you were, I knew you were coming through. Oh, man, that's great. Now I can use you. Amen. That's where we should be as believers. Not looking at our life and saying, well, there's some distance, but that's just the way it goes. No, that's not the way it goes. That's the way we go. Amen. But, but God's going a different way. It's that recognition that what we say and what we do are not the same that spurs us to be able to make things right. It's whenever we get back on track with the Lord. Now notice <clears throat> that it says in verse number 59, he says, I thought on my ways. And then he says, and I turned my feet unto thy testimonies. I love that. I started looking at that word testimonies. So what is the difference on these things? They're all different, amen? And, and I started tracking down that word testimonies. The word means it's a witness. It's a witness. Specifically, it's talking about a duplicate of what is real. What is true? It's kind of like a die on a coin. <clears throat> Every coin that you've got, there was a die that stamped that thing out. Amen? And that stamp, uh, it had to be approved. And, and what they would do in every coin, and, and bill for that matter, is whenever they would stamp it, there would be certain witness marks on that coin. They don't just chunk out a, you know, it was like, here's a brown one, there's a penny. No, no, there, there's specific uh, 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 witness marks, whether it's the, the, the face of a president, whether it's a little hash mark off to the side, whether it's a little superimposed 20 on your $20 bill or whatever the case, but there's something on there that is a witness saying this is what is true. And if a coin or a dollar or a bill is missing those witness marks, what does that mean? It means it's a counterfeit. It's counterfeit. David said, I considered my ways. And he says, my ways were not in line with God. My, my ways were not lining up with what I said that I was going to do in relation to my portion, who is my Lord himself. He says, he says, I'm looking at my life, and he says, my life is a faulty witness. And he says, I don't want to be a counterfeit believer. You know, every one of us should want to make sure that we are not a counterfeit Christian. Amen? We don't need to be anything false in our life. And the blessing of David was that he didn't try to excuse himself. I love that very much. He didn't claim his kingship. He's like, hey, Lord, that's just the way it is. You put me here. You know the hardships I'm going through. I'm, man, I'm the king. I've got all these problems. He didn't claim that. Instead, he says, I'm turning my feet. Lord, I recognize there's a difference between me and, and you and your will and my will, and I'm turning my feet. He says, I'm doing it hastily. He says, I made haste. I delayed not to keep thy commandments. He says, I'm not going to delay making things right in my life. David's repentance came because of a recognition that his witness was not in line with God's testimony. He says, oh, I want to be true. I want to be right. Practical repentance, <clears throat> it always restores what's broken. It always restores what's false, what's distant. Very practically, what is it? It's a change of mind. Amen? It's a, it's a recognition of what God shows you, and then there's that determination to say, I better get back on track. All of us are going to have multiple times in our life where there has to be some practical repentance. A matter of being able to say, you know, I have let distance between me and God. And even though I could claim all these things, it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Amen. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7, verse number 9, he says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner that you might receive damage by us in nothing. Whenever David saw something wrong, his repentant, heart sought to make it right. He says, that's what I want. I want to make it right. He just wanted to be closer to God. <clears throat> Think about my inheritance. Think about that ring. Man, I, I tell you what, there's nothing I wouldn't give to be able to sit on that couch one more time with my granddaddy. I, 
I would, I would give anything to be able to do that. But I'm going to see him again. And here's the glory of all glories. I can sit with my Lord. And he's right there. And he's willing to meet with me. He's willing to listen to what it is. That he, he's willing to hear me whenever I say, Lord, I'm not where I should be. Lord, I want to get back in line. He says, good. That's what I want too. Amen. Amen. All of a sudden, that's the joy of David here. He says, thou art my portion. He says, it's not one day in the future. He says, right now I can come to my Savior. The more that we come to know and understand the Lord himself is our portion. He is our inheritance that he does not withhold from us, the more it should stir us to be more in line with his word, to be more interested in what it is that he has to say in our life and more, uh, more accountable to the word of God and making sure that we're in line with him, ready to walk with him. Psalm 84, 11 says, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. What does that mean? <clears throat> he says, you want to know the good things in life? Quit walking distant from God. Get back on track. He's your portion. He's your inheritance. It's not in the future. It's now. It's today. It's what God wants. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for allowing us the privilege of being able to look at this passage of Scripture. Thank you, Lord, that you have preserved your word for us. Thank you, God, for this great testimony of such a man as David to be able to recognize how important it was to be able to have you as his inheritance his portion. Lord, I pray, Father, that you would help us to be just as mindful of all the ways that you desire to be able to meet with us. Lord, stir our hearts to be back in, in great fellowship with you, Lord, just following your plan. Lord, if there's one here that's just kind of walking at a guilty distance, help us, Lord, to be able to get back on track. We know that there's so much that you desire to accomplish. We want to thank you for your grace and goodness. Thank you for your blessings that you extend. Thank you, Lord, that we know that you are our portion. We give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. We are dismissed. And men, if you'll meet, meet me back there in the back, we'll have a quick men's meeting.